Welcome to Believe in 76ers with your host, former 76ers point guard Eric Snow and two Sixers fanatics in Marcus and Tasia Dash. Believe in 76ers is presented by BetOnline.ag. BetOnline is your number one source for all your sports betting needs. Get the latest odds, lines, and matchup reports for baseball, boxing, golf, and more. BetOnline continues to be the fastest and easiest way to place your wagers, including live betting and your favorite casino and card games available to play right from your phone. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and get in on the action. Remember to use promo code BELIEVE for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. BetOnline, where the game starts. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Believe in 76ers podcast. I'm Marcus Dash here with legendary 76ers point guard Eric Snow and my brother Tasia Dash. Guys, we're uh, a tough one. This could be one of our last episodes of the season of us playing before we get to the offseason. So I am very nervous, Eric, uh, about tonight's game. Uh, before we get into everything about the, about the game tonight, what are your what are your thoughts uh, about about tonight? Are you do you think it's over? Uh, no, I think we fight. I mean, I, I think the how the game is going will determine it. Um, I don't think we tap out, um, but and I don't think it's it's enough separation between the two teams that um, you won't see a, a team that still believe they can win. I believe that locker room, Sixers locker room, believe they can still win the series. Um, unlike some other series, you, you, I think teams are like, man, this is over. Um, I don't think our locker room is like that. Um, I don't think a team is coming in believing that they're better, um, really giving away a game. So it should be two to two and then getting there and be like, oh, it's over. We can't win there. When um, you win, I mean, that's an uphill battle. But unlike being down 3-0, this has been done before. So – but it starts by winning one game. I mean, you just got to win the game in front of you. There's no, there's no need to look ahead. You got to win the game in front of you. So do I believe that we can win? Yes. Um, am I concerned? Hey, I'm highly concerned. Um, and and I should be down 3-1. Um, but I do believe that we can win the game. Teja, your nervous level. Extremely high. I mean, it's not even – we've had, what, double-digit leads in, I think, every game. So we've had a firm lead in every game. And so it's like even even when you're supposed to feel good in-game, I don't feel that good in any of these games because the moment we have a double-digit lead, it just goes away. So, um, yeah, I mean, every like Batum said, every game is pretty much a game seven now. So we're, we're, we're in game seven mode for the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah, you would have hoped that would have began last game, but nonetheless, we'll get into last game right now. Um, so Sunday, game four, another tough loss, this time at home. Uh, and and B had some tough criticism for the lack of Philadelphia fans in the arena. Uh, he was quoted saying, I've never seen it, and I've been here for 10 years. Yeah, it kind of pisses me off, especially because Philly is considered a sports town. They've always shown up, and I don't think that should happen. Yeah, it's not okay. So a lot of people were there was it got a mixed bag online. Some people were like upset that he said this, but I agree with him wholeheartedly. I mean, I noticed that the for the first game of Philadelphia, I know I noticed a lot of New York fans in there. But what do you guys make of uh, Embiid's critique of uh, the Philadelphia fan base not coming out for Game Four? It's it's you know it's a double edged sword to me a little bit because. When I played there, it was always some rowdy Nick fans there. Always, um, they just left disappointed majority of the time, if not all the time, <laughs> you know. Um, so didn't really bother, you know what I'm saying? But we had, I thought, I felt that we had a great support system when we played in New York. You know, we never played yeah. them in the playoffs, so you don't know how that dynamic kind of looks. Um, but it wasn't surprising to me to see a lot of Nick fans there. Um, what's disappointing to me is the fact that their location of their seats, 
is telling me that a lot of season ticket holders sold their tickets. That's what it's telling me. So that's not necessarily Sixer fans. Those are the season ticket Sixer fans that he need to have a beef with. Um, so maybe they need to put some kind of system in, like you could only sell your stuff through the team and this and that. But now when everybody out here trying to, you know, you have, you have, it's a close, close proximity as far as New York, people can get there fast. They can get there easy. It's a day trip for a lot of teams. Not like you got to, you know, it's not like you have to go and stay overnight and fly. Most of these people, a lot of people, one, a lot of people from New York that live in Philly, a lot of people that take the train or drive down and they're there for that game and they can go back home. That's yep. a that's a great game to go to, especially on an early Sunday afternoon. So I know, and a lot of those people are willing to pay a lot of money for that ticket. So for some people, that's an opportunity to make some money. It's no different than when I went to see my son um um there's when they played Michigan. And it was both teams were undefeated, and they were um, playing at Michigan State. And I had my seats that I had for the whole year, and I know who sat in front of me. I knew the people sat in front of me. And come that game, it was four people from Michigan fans sitting in front of me. So they sold their tickets. So I seen the guy the next day, and he was like, man, they paid me X amount. I don't want to say how much. X amount of tickets. X amount of money per ticket. I just I couldn't refuse it. That's what's happening. Because that's what happened then. That's that's exactly what's happening. So it's not a sixer fan base, it's a sixer season ticket fan base, in my opinion. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't look at it that way. But it's funny because if you have season tickets in the fifth row, you're probably doing all right, right? You need the money that bad. You know what I mean? So it's like it's the people up there that probably, you know, don't have that extra do re me laying around, but the people in the top three, the, the bottom three rows right. down there. It's, it's a, it's a price. It's a price for everything, man. No, nah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, definitely. Obviously in this so case, they paying right. a lot. So they probably got a lot. And, and, so, yeah, and, I, and, I, and, that I kind of was debating on whether I should say is do they believe we can I, win? The people that sell oh, their tickets. Oh, oh. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like that that is a question. Do they believe we can win? Because why if you if if you're and that's the tough part like you're a Sixer fan and you have tickets um in my mind I'm not thinking I'm about to sell these tickets. I'm like I'm going to see my team play. Yeah. So, but if somebody come to you and 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 now they have the ability, I believe they have the ability to sell your tickets. Um, you know, everything is digital or email. You can just send tickets to somebody easily. So yeah, you put those great. tickets up on the, um, you know, you say for instance, we got we got season tickets. We all sit beside each other, right? And and we sit up here and we're like, all right, man. Man, I want to go to the game, but man, I'll sell this ticket for $5,000. You put it on there for $5,000. Boom, it sells. What you going to do? That's what I think a lot of these people are doing. I think they're putting crazy amount of money on that ticket, and it's getting bought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's getting bought. Money's talking. Yes. Yeah. And... What doesn't help, because I mean, on the surface, I hear what Embiid's saying, and I agree with it. It sucks. But what doesn't help is that we lost that game and that people are questioning things like effort down the stretch and boxing out and getting rebounds. It's like there's a lot of games to dog fans for not being present for. I don't know if that was the game to do it. Yeah, I, I, I don't. It's not like it was a double overtime, like heartbreaker, or the game that the refs took away from us. We couldn't get a freaking yeah, I mean, rebound. Well, well, it's, it's, 
I understand, but it's, I understand, but what I'm saying is that when there's no other time to address it other than when it happened. So if he addressed it after they play in New York, it's not relevant. I mean, he could have you could have won in New York to come and say, hey, we need the Philly fans to you know show up and show out. But like I said, I don't think it's the Philly fans. I don't think it's the Philly fan base. A lot of people that I know that support Philly, they they support Philly. They, they're not giving up no tickets to no New York Knicks fan. So, like I say, man, this, I, I think it's I think it's people just they trying to get paid, and you can't yeah. knock their hustle. Um, but I think it's up to the Sixers to figure out a different system then. Um, because you can't, we can't say that you sold all these tickets and you got all these season ticket holders and then you get to the guts of the playoff in the first round. And then you have all these Nick fans sitting in those six or seats, season ticket season, six or seats. But there were a lot of, I looked, there were a lot of face value tickets available for the game. So it didn't just, it didn't sell out. Which is that's weak. That part's weak. But that's what I'm trying to say. Like, 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 wh where'd you get? Where'd you see the tickets being sold at? P people posted links and and uh, screenshots of like the main like Sixer like website. So from like the Sixers tickets website, it, it didn't sell out. But that's what I'm saying. So, but that's what I'm saying. Like, once you get certain tickets from the Sixers, you can resell them, but you resell them through the Sixers. That's what I'm saying. Oh, is, am I right or wrong on that? So, I don't know, actually. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how that works. I don't know. But but because someone so came with that kinda, counterpoint, you kind of put them up to be sold. You kind of put them up to be sold through them. And, and that goes with the make and money on the open market. That goes with the side hustle, make your money where yeah. you can argument. But what about the ones that just sold yes. for face value? So you're just choosing not to go to your game for the same price as the ticket costs. Yeah, I mean that's and that's where I and that's where to me um, I have to question that's just weak stand. because my thing is if you if you look at most people that I know that are serious Sixer fans, serious Sixer fans, and they have tickets to a game, and something happens and they aren't able to to go. I'm 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 not even going to say ninety nine percent. I'm one. 100% sure they have someone that are Sixer fans that would go in their place. Yeah. Yeah. So That's weird, though. So if you have tickets and you don't just give them away, like, I would have been like, all right, well, can my son go? Can this guy? Like, somebody that I know that roots for the team, I would have just gave the tickets to them. Why but wouldn't you want to go? At not. the end of the day, at the, in, at the end of the day, um, some kind of system needs to be put in place. But but now we see why. What 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 was that? Was it football or was it pro football or somewhere where somebody wouldn't you couldn't sell your tickets to a, a different team or something like where where was it? I can't remember. It was somewhere. I seen it. Um, it's a good rule. I never I, I, I never heard of that one. It it was it was. I, forget, I can't. I try. To, I'm sure I'll think of it as soon as we finish. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It was like you can't sell your tickets to the opposite team fans. And um, yes, I know it happened. In, my son told me it happened in soccer, but I could have swore it happened in football here. Maybe the NFL or somewhere, maybe with the 49ers or something. The Rams. No, it was the Rams and 49ers. Uh, that's I believe that's who it was. Because remember, um, they played in the playoffs and they had all those 49er fans. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is a long article, but it's the, the, the title of it. Is, yes, teams try to sometimes limit opposing fans buying tickets. Um, but yes. I'm, I'm that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. but, but how do they know that? They just ask them. The Rams put ask, something yeah. in specifically. Yeah, they, Maybe put, zip they put something in specifically to do it. I forgot. I, I can't remember what it was, but they actually had a plan in place to prevent it from happening. Interesting. Hmm. Wow. Well, I think Sha Shaq on the post game show Sunday after Embiid's comments, he said, like, 
as a player, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed to not give the opposing fans reasons to to talk. You're supposed to win that game and, and shut them up instead of complaining about it after the fact. That's what that's what Shaq essentially said after the game. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's why I said earlier I was like it was always Knicks fans when we played they just just left disappointed. That's why that's why it was never an issue with us. There was always a lot of Knicks fans in there, down close, loud, rambunctious. Always like that, and always left the same way. That's the difference. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that. Just you know, you don't come up in our house, and but I don't know how the Sixer fans are now. But I know when I played, the Sixer fans were like pissed off that they came in there like that. You would think, yeah. So the Rams so tried to win it. rowdy and louder. The Rams tried to limit tick, the Rams tried to limit ticket purchases to credit card holders with certain cleared zip codes. <laughs> so <told you. laughs> yeah. Wow. Yes, they tried to do it. <laughs> this was harder to do with the Flyers because when they played New Jersey, a lot of people had certain overlapping zip codes with that. So they had a hard time with that. Yes. Um easier to do with Niners in, in LA, although that's not that far away either. Um that's interesting, though. Yeah. Uh, another more modern tactic that Titans leadership reportedly utilized would be restricting mobile ticket transfers until 24 hours before the game. Though for the passive ticket buyer, this might scare off a buyer or two from feeling uncertain about buying a ticket that is not in their ticket master account immediately. So they try, they try to like, hinder it a little bit. Interesting. That's what I said. They Sixers, they got to do something different then. Yeah. Yeah. It would be tough to do that. Philadelphia has to do that. <laughs> Philadelphia shouldn't have to do that stuff. That, that's the original point. It's, thing not, Philadelphia. it's not Philadelphia. It's the Sixers yeah. fans. Because yeah. Yes. The Eagles okay. wouldn't have. That wouldn't happen with the Eagles. No. No. <laughs> But apparently it happened with the Flyers. So that's two Philadelphia franchises right there. Yeah. Well, who who was, was the Flyers playing? Uh, New Jersey. Who were the Flyers playing? New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey's right. I mean, it's a lot of people that live in New Jersey that's <laughs> closer to the arena than people that live in Philly. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Proximity wise, that's a tough that's a tough one, Philadelphia, New Jersey. Yeah. 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 All right. So we're gonna go to our next topic here. Um, talking about the non embiid minutes. Um, so that's obviously been a talk pretty much all season, really. But uh shocker, we're a lot better with Embiid on the court. And it seems like even if we have a double digit lead, the moment he comes off the court, it evaporates. Yet it also seemed like he was completely out of gas in the closing moments of that game, which also hurt us as well. So the question I want to ask you guys is, is it better to sit and beat and get dominated while he's out or play him for extended periods and deal with him being exhausted down the stretch? Whew. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't, you got to rest him. Um, he, he was the, the play to where he got his shot blocked when the shot clock ran out. Um, he was standing there on the sideline with his hands on his knees during the action. Uh, um, it's not, it's not, he, <clears throat> my belief is most guys that are pro players is very few guys that you can play them. If they usually average 34 to 32 to 36 minutes, they'll probably give you the same thing in 32 to 36 minutes that they'll give you in 34 to 38. There's very few guys that you can extend them to 40, 44, and then all of a sudden they give you a huge difference in their numbers. Um, because what they do when they play those extra four to five, six minutes, they end up coasting for part of that time anyway. Um, I think they have to, if Precious Acu is in the game, then they have to play Paul Reed during that time. They have to be a little more strategic in – when they're taking Joel out, take him out before timeouts in the first quarter, or second quarter, take him out before the end of the quarter, first quarter, third quarter. So then that, uh, that extends his break, even though from 
game time, his minutes may, may be still long, but his break time off, off the court is longer, but the game time minutes off the court is shorter. Mm-hmm. So you just have to be a little more strategic when you're taking them out. Like, like I said, before timeouts, before the end of quarters, um, he should never really close the first and third quarter. Um, so then that, those that's extra game time where he's out during those timeouts, um, during those end of those quarters. So you to me, that's how you have to do it. Um, especially if you're going to extend his minutes because he played he played 40, what, 44, 40 some minutes like that, whatever it was. And and I, I'm telling you, he was coasting for it, three or four of them easily. Um, it, it was clear. It was clear. Do you think that the coaching staff makes a decision to say, hey, coasting Embiid is better than Paul Reed? They must be, right? Because they didn't take him out that second half hardly. So I mean Yeah, yeah, I I I I I don't think that I think that that's their I think that's their viewpoint. I just don't think they say it like yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that's yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Sure, they say I'd rather have him on the court. Let's just play through somebody else when he's on the court, but his mm-hmm. presence on the court is making them adjust or making it simple or easier for guys. Um, so, I, yes, I, I I do think that they feel his presence on the court is better than his minutes on the court, even if he's winded a little bit. Um, but like I said, then that's when they're gonna have to be a little more strategic, strategic on play calling, set calling, um, yeah. timeouts, substitutions, all of that stuff has to be addressed if you're going to extend his minutes. It's also like it seems like they do it when they get when they get up to a certain point in the league. Because I I, I watched, I think it was last game in the game before we just hit a shot, we went, went up by like 10 or 12. And he looked immediate, immediately at the bench, and he was like, "Like no," because I think they were like, "Okay, we're up by 12. Let's get Paul Reed in there for like three minutes, and uh, you know, let's see if we can hold this lead somewhat close to what we have it right now while he's out. That's like a buffer for them." Um, and I think he's like, "No, no, 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 no. Let's get it up to like 16 or 18, and then pull me out." So like, maybe that's how they're doing it right now, depending on how much we're up and if we have like some kind of insurance built up. I, I don't know, but. He's going to play a lot tonight because it's an elimination game. Um, I don't know if Nurse got to save timeouts and just use those to rest him as much as they do to stop action of momentum. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the coaching staff needs to pull some rabbits out of their hat, man, because I don't know if it's playing Bombo a little more tonight when you pull him. Uh, that's something. Get a little different flavor out there. Get a little more size. Get a little more shot blocking because – they're attacking. I forgot what the stats were, but they're attacking, and it's working when he's off the floor. There's no shot blocking uh, presence whatsoever. Uh, I feel like at least Bomba has a little more of that length and fear. Okay, um, so let me let me let me ask you a let me ask you a question then. Then why don't we attack when um, they go small? I mean, they, they were small down the stretch. They had like they had like three. Their tallest guy was like six eight. Okay, so why didn't we attack the basket there? Our offense was terrible. So why, why 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 how are they able to do it and we can't do it? Because uh, we were trying to play a two man game between Maxi and an exhausted MB the last five six minutes of the game. Got, come on now, y'all been talking about all this offensive genius stuff now. I know. I I, ever since he came, ever since he showed up, that's all I I've been know. hearing from y'all. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't talking to Sixers fans. I'm talking to you two. That's all I've been hearing. I know. I know you are. Yeah, I got it. And I told y'all, they, I told you from the beginning of the year, they tell me all this creativity, and I'm like, there's no creativity to get the ball to your two best players and get them in a position to shoot. Creativity yeah. comes when you're getting other people easy shots and easy layups. That's creativity. This stuff is just talent. Here. Here you go, Joe. I'll post up at the free throw line. We will give you the ball. Yeah. That's not creativity. No, I feel like when we, we panic, actually doing the Knicks a favor by giving him the ball free throw line, he ended up taking that. He ended up at the top of the key. 
he don't he's he's not he's not offensive rebounding. He's basically and then keeping him out on pick and road defensively. So he's basically playing from free throw line to free throw line. We did have a lot of open looks that fourth quarter. We just weren't making them. Like Nurse said, he he said MB made the right read. Well, we didn't play our shooters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but like, yeah. like we we have. I'm just saying, like we we say now we saying miss shots, but we don't play the guy that's supposed to that was supposed to come here as a shooter. No, he's yeah. not playing. Yep. Come on, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a lot of things to pick from this. No doubt. Like the Kelly Oubre pull so, up jumper at the end of the game. But I did tell you guys. I told you guys. But, but, but I did tell you guys um, after the trade deadline when I told them we picked up Kyle Lowry, I told them picking up Kyle Lowry was going to hurt Buddy Hill. I told y'all that. You did. We were one of nine from three in the fourth quarter. I did not expect him to get – I did. I, I did not expect for him to get Kyle Lowry and play him as much as he's playing now. I didn't expect that. But I'm not surprised. But I didn't expect it. So if Kyle's playing that many minutes, somebody's not playing. Yeah. And now he's playing Cam. He wasn't playing Cam as much early in, this, in the series. I know. Um, so somebody – then he decides to play Melton. So somebody has to not play now. Yep. Yeah. Especially when three out of your four stars are playing 40 plus minutes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Larry was one of the two players on our starting um, five that plus minus. Plus. But yeah. Still. He had a what? I said he was one of our two starters that had, had a, a plus a plus minus. Yeah. Who was the other one? Joel. Joel? Yeah. Plus one. Joel? Plus one, plus one, yeah. But he probably – in how many minutes did he play with Joel? <laughs> yeah, uh, Larry question. only played – Larry yeah, only played, played three, minutes, with that, he only played three minutes without Joel. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. That's why. <laughs> That's easy to figure out. That's why I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> he must have played his minutes with that guy. Because he was <laughs> – because he was one of – he was one of six, so – I mean, something must have happened. I'm just, I'm just saying that's why. Like, he basically played all his minutes with that guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think the Knicks are kind of a testament to all like the super team top heavy rosters out there? Um, do you think that they're kind of a like? I I, I think we want to be more of a top heavy get stars on our team, but they're like the opposite, right? They have a bunch of functional role players who do their roles really well. And a different guy seems to go off for 10 plus points every game. Um, We're like the opposite. We have two guys that need to do everything. And we're hoping that one of the other guys can get like 15 or 20. Here's what you've gotten from, the Knicks um, this series. Um, so you think back to when I played for the Sixers. Um, I was going to play point guard, run the team, defend the opposing team's best guard. Aaron McKee was going to play backup point guard, backup shooting guard, backup three, close the games at the three. Defend, run the team, help do everything else he was responsible for. George Lynch was going to defend the three, defend the four, rebound, run, hit corner, shot. Tyrone Hill, defend the four, rebound, play small ball sometime, rebound, play hard. Dikembe, block shots, rebound, play the five, play his position, take over. Everybody knew they roll. Um, but here's the thing about that. Everybody knew AI was going to come out and get buckets. That's what he was going to do. Uh, bring the energy, get buckets be the best player on the court. But you can go into that, and for the most part, the things that were expected, the things that were your, were your role, is what you got from that player. Now, whether you if you got something extra or what you wanted from that player, maybe not all the time. 
but what was expected you got from that person majority of the time. Now, I, I'm asking with our team, what is it that people bring to the team that you can go into every game and say, I know X is going to do this. I know Y is going to do this. I know B is going to do this. That's called an identity. The New York Knicks have an identity. They all know what they're doing, and they do it to the best of their ability, and you know what you're going to get, going to get from them. With us, we know Joel's going to score. We know Maxie's going to score. Outside of that, what is the identity? What does Tobias Harris bring for us? What is he supposed to bring for us? What does Kelly bring for us? What is he supposed to bring for us? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. No, I get it. Yeah. So we like Buddy Hill's supposed to bring shooting for us, but he doesn't play and or don't get shots, and we don't call plays for him. Yeah. So how are we expecting him to bring shooting and he's not getting the opportunities to shoot? Yep. But I'm watching the team over there who all those guys that shoot threes get shots. Yep. Little dudes coming in shooting threes. Um other kid from Villanova, can't think of his name, gets threes. Dante, he gets threes. Bowen gets threes. Why can't we get a guy to shoot threes that's supposed to shoot threes? How can, how can we have Joel and Maxie and we can't get a guy open three? How is that possible? Have a 34-point score and a 26-point score, and we, and we say we can't get Buddy Hill to wide open shot on a play. Just involve those two guys. Yeah. I'd say the next players that have identity on our team are, I'd say Lowry has kind of the take charge leadership, cooler head type role. And I'd say even campaign has developed his, his role off the bench. Pretty good. He comes out there and he just guns it. At least, at least I know what he's doing when a campaign's out there, he pushing it you and he's taking he's an open jumper. Okay. Outside of that, everyone's kind yeah. of like a that that so 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 that's what I'm trying to say. So you, you didn't name three guys, three or four guys that's playing 30 plus minutes. Yeah. Yeah. U I mean U Ubre takes jumper. Ubre's not bashful. He 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 puts it out there. He's just inconsistent with it. That's all. But he he does he is aggressive. Um that's why I read today someone saying, like, you know what? Stagger Tobias. Let Tobias come off, not come off the bench and not be benched, but stagger him more. Let him play with the second unit a little more. Let him be a little more aggressive in ISO then if that's what he wants, if that's what his strong suit is. Like, having him sit in the corner, it's not doing Are we still on this Tobias stuff? Oh, we're talking about identity. Are we still on this? Are we still on this Tobias stuff? Are I we mean, still Tobias stuff? I mean, yeah, I'm just exactly. saying, like, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what we do when, when Tobias is going like Doc Rivers. It's like, who are we going to blame then? I didn't say blame, but he's averaging like seven points this series, man. Like, we got to talk about that at some point, right? I mean, you know, I, I like one double digit yeah, game. And, 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 and during his average of, and during his seven points and one double digit game, we are minus 38 on the offensive boards. So that has nothing to do with points. We could have won yeah. two games by by rebounding. Okay, and he's rebounded well this series, actually. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. When people want to talk about points. We we'll talk about Tobias and talk about Tobias. Get, talk about Tobias getting the rebound, not Tobias scoring. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy about that. I just well, not that I'm scoring. We got two guys that want to score thirty points a game. I know, I know, but I, I think. I wasn't using. I mean, I'm it as we a, got, you got two guys that shoot all the time, and then we want to we want to worry about another guy whether he can score ten points. I wasn't trying we to got criticize two guys trying Tobias. to get fifty every game. I think he's. I think Tobias is capable of way more. I'd like to see him reach that and like get those shot attempts up. And the fact that two guys shoot every time that's what's preventing it. It's not going to happen here. I've been saying it for two years. I've been saying it for two years. It's not going to happen there. The way they play and the way they play him, it's not going to happen. So let's just stop talking about what he should be doing, what he could be doing. He's not going to get it. They're going to have two guys. It's, it's, they're shooting all the time. 
I know, I know he did, yeah. but he's not going to do it with this team. That was before Tyrese Maxey came shooting 25 times or 20 some times a game. It's not going to happen. The pecking order has changed. Maxey's second now. And the third guy is a huge gap between third and second. Yeah, it's, it's a huge game. Yeah. So you you if you look at if you didn't know the salaries, I'll give you an example. If you didn't know the salaries, mm-hmm. you you wouldn't think as much of a difference between Kelly and Tobias the way they're playing. No, yeah. But we Not look at, at Tobias salary and then we expect more. But if you look at how they're played. You would never think one makes way more money than the other nope. because they're played exactly the same. Yes. Yeah. Kelly's just more aggressive, I think. Right. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> they always shoot around the same amount of times. I mean, he, he may get more. Sometimes he get more opportunities because, because of where he is and how he's played. Uh, I do think he slashes to the court. Yeah, slashes to the basket more. And from that standpoint, yeah, he does all that more. Um, but I don't know. I can't say that's why he gets more shots. I really don't know. I don't think either one of them was a focus as far as they need to come out and say we're getting him 15 shots a game. I don't think either one was a shot attempt, like The shot attempts are nearly identical, actually. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You can't tell the difference. Yeah. Well, we said it before last game. It, to, to win the game, the rebounding battle needs to be close or we need to win the re- rebounding battle. We can't lose it by a five-plus because that's another two possessions, three possessions, four possessions they get on the offensive glass, and we can't afford that. Even the game we won, down the stretch, we got some of those rebounds. If they had gotten those rebounds, they probably would have won that game too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you anticipate seeing Mo Bamba, or, or are you surprised we haven't seen a lot of Mo Bamba at all? I mean, he hasn't played at all this series. Are, are you surprised he's we haven't seen him? Uh, he's not. No, no, they're not. Would you have made a change at, at some point? Game, Eric, game five, I think he's more he's more inclined to stretch some minutes. He'll play Paul Reed and maybe play Paul like a yo-yo. Put him in, take him out. Put him in, take him out. He'll do something different like that. I don't. I don't think you see Mo Bamba. Very interesting. Can't wait to see what what happens tonight. Uh, still, the Nixon one thing I him in the Jalen, they'll put him in the Jalen pick and roll for the whole the whole time he's in there. Yeah, you're right. Hmm. Now, if you uh, can, if scenario. you find a way to play a zone or something, you play a zone or something, you can steal some minutes and play a zone and put him in the middle and let him be long and big at the rim. Well, maybe you can see it, but outside of that, I don't think it's happening. No. Are you surprised we didn't see him at all this series? No, I'm not surprised. If I I was, if I was, if I was deciding whether he would play or not, I would have said that they weren't going to play. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Uh, we're gonna go to our final uh, topics here. Um, so obviously, before we get before we get to game picks, I've been seeing a lot of this with this being an elimination game. Uh, a lot of uh, conversations on Twitter about um, is it? So I'm gonna ask you guys these questions here. So, is it better to play at home to New York fans as the favorite or the underdog in New York with what? As Embiid said, no pressure on us going into this game tonight. Well, I mean, the no pressure isn't from the fans, and no pressure is if you lose, you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no need to worry about anything else because you have to win the game in order to, to keep playing. Um, I don't know. I see it differently. Now, I've heard this whole thing is guys like playing on the road because it's more pressure when you're not expected to win. I mean, less pressure when you're not expected to win. I don't know. I felt be playing at home and having people behind you and the crowd loud and was to me was better for me. So, um, but I have heard it the other way, but I'd rather play home. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the other one that uh, it's talking about, if we win tonight, so um, 
we'd obviously go back to game six and a lot of Sixers fans think even if we win tonight, we're going to lose in game six in front of the home crowd. So my, my question is kind of same, same piggybacking off that last question. Would it be worse to lose in New York in a game five or to go back home to Philadelphia and lose in a game six? What would be worse kind of for, for the team's kind of morale and everything going into the off season? Losing in five games, only winning one game. The fewer games you win, the, the to me, the worse. So I, it, to me, it's not where you lose, it's how many games you lose. I mean, how many games you win. Yeah. All right, so that gives us two more final into, topics. You know, we went into the series and – so we went into the series thinking we were better in this team, and you telling me that we can only win one game? Like that's 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 boring. Yeah. That's yeah, well. I mean both, both both scenarios suck. Losing in five sucks, and losing two straight at home to get bounced sucks. But you always want to live to fight another day. So it's better just to win as many games as possible. Um and yeah, it's it's as far as the pressure, I mean, we're underdogs already, we're on the brink of elimination, so the more odds against us, I guess, the better and more relaxed we might feel. But, I mean, we're, we're up against it, so we have the pressure anyway to, to go home. Um, and, I mean, Philly and New York, apparently, it's 50-50 yeah. fans anyway. So, <laughs> even if we're playing at home, we're kind of playing, like, you know, against a new half New York crowd, right? So, what does it matter? Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. So, last topic here, our game picks tonight. So this is kind of interesting. So, uh, and B didn't go to shoot around this morning because he has a migraine with his uh, the Bell's palsy that he has. That's a symptom of it. Uh, Kelly Oubre did not go to shoot around either. He's he's dealing with an illness. Um, so both those guys are questionable for tonight's game. But the line of this game has gone from five to four and a half, and some sport books have it at a three and a half point line. So the Knicks are favored in some sport books by only three and a half points, which is interesting based on you know playing at home and also with our guys uh, being injured and you know having illnesses. But uh. So the the line that I have right now is still four points. Uh, so what do you guys have um, in this game? Man, we we're gonna win because we have to win. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we win, so we we cover. So I, I'm saying we win it. I don't know how we mean. We maybe we win by two points, but either way it go, we're gonna win it. Um, go home and win, and come back and see how Game Seven looks. Finally put some pressure we, on them. I think we win by one possession. I think uh, we're up by like two, and they have the final shot, and they miss a three. That's what I think happens. Yeah. Thanks Heart a lot. Attacks. Heart attack <laughs> over Philadelphia, all, all you know over the United States. I'll even, I'll even throw an offensive rebound in there. They get an offensive rebound, tip it backwards, take another three, and miss it. Could you imagine that? <laughs> I mean, that would just be – the summary of this entire series, by the way, yeah. right there. Yeah, so pretty much, pretty much uh, yeah. game two. I can't imagine this. Not I don't want shot. it to happen. <laughs> <sighs> Oh, well, we're, this podcast is uh, living to hopefully living to fight another day as far as uh, talking about in season gameplay. So hopefully, when we see you guys next time on Friday, we're gonna be talking about this game. Game six would be Thursday, correct? So we'd be talking about previewing potential game seven matchups. Our, yeah. our show on Friday, no off season talk yet. So we're gonna we're gonna hope that the next time we see you guys is previewing game seven. So we'll see you guys Friday. We hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And hopefully, we get two straight wins, guys. <laughs>